This video should give you all you need to know about power, sensitivity, and impedance to help you understand how these numbers could affect your home audio or home theater buying decisions. Now let's get started. You've probably seen these three terms when shopping for speakers, but did you know they also should be considered when you're choosing what component will power your speakers? Well, let's go over all of these in simple terms to help you understand what numbers matter and how you need to think about the relationship between your speaker specifications and your amplifier or home theater receiver. First, let's start with speakers. When you're shopping around for speakers, you'll find several numbers in their specifications section. These are usually the minimum and maximum recommended power, sensitivity, and impedance. One thing that makes these numbers a little tricky is that there is no worldwide rule that speaker manufacturers have to follow when publishing their specifications. This is where our team of passionate audio and home theater experts' advice can be invaluable to you. We are just a phone call or a chat away to help you decide if the components that you're looking at will match up together and are good for your room. Now, most speaker manufacturers state the minimum recommended power needed to produce decent volumes from a particular speaker in an average sized room. The maximum figure listed is the power level that they can withstand continuously without damaging the speaker components. However, these numbers usually come from steady test signals, not the full dynamics of actual music. And for many music lovers, just getting into this, these numbers can lead to a bad decision. Standard logic would tell you that just like driving where you're going too fast can lead to an accident, too much power could damage your speakers. Well, it turns out the opposite is actually true. Music is very dynamic, with swings that range from extremely quiet to super loud. When these loud peaks occur, the demand for amplifier power goes way up. If you're playing at a pretty loud level when a peak hits and your amplifier doesn't have enough power for that peak, the amplifier will do what is called clipping. This sends a distorted signal to your speakers, which in most cases either partially damages or fully blows the tweeters in your speakers. In all of our years of experience, when we see damaged speakers come into our shop, it's almost always due to someone trying to play too loud with too little power, not too much power. Now, sure, with a huge amplifier that you played wide open for a really long time, you might possibly damage your speakers, but that's extremely rare. As a matter of fact, we prefer you have as much power as possible and don't really worry about about the maximum power rating too much. When a dynamic passage comes, your amp will sail through with no strain on the music or your ears. Okay, so then the question really is here, how much power do you really need? Well, that depends on another spec called speaker sensitivity, the volume of your room, and your listening tastes. You'll see sensitivity numbers like 89 dB, 91 dB, 93 dB, and more. This is technically supposed to be the measured decibel level with a microphone one meter from the speaker with pink noise playing, which is basically all the audio frequencies all at one time. Now the catch is, some speaker companies measure their speakers in a room that adds some reflections, which will raise this number somewhat, while others use an anechoic chamber to give a more honest result. The higher the speaker sensitivity Spec, the less power it will take to drive your speakers. This means you can get by with a smaller amplifier if your speakers have a high sensitivity rating. But what numbers show high sensitivity? Well, most speakers fall in the 88 to 90 dB range, which we would consider medium sensitivity. If you're looking at speakers with sensitivity specs below 88 dB, you'll wanna have an amplifier that can deliver pretty serious power. When you start getting to 93 dB and above, those speakers are entering high sensitivity territory. Now bear in mind, a 10 dB difference is perceived as twice as loud to the human ear, and you have to double amplifier power for each 3 dB increase. This means there's a pretty big difference in what you'll experience between a speaker with 90 dB sensitivity and one with 96 dB or greater. Even many horn type speakers have an extremely high sensitivity number, and you'll see owners of those speakers using small five or 10 watts per channel tube amps on them and be able to drive them to very loud levels. And some music lovers also contend the higher the sensitivity of a speaker, the better it can portray the dynamic contrast of music, while others will swear by a medium sensitivity speaker and a massive Macintosh high power amplifier that can provide those same dynamics due to all the extra power on board. Now, in addition, the size of your space also plays a role in this. It's gonna take much more power to fill up a very large space compared to a smaller room, given the same pair of speakers. So as a general rule, the lower the sensitivity number and or the larger your room, the more power you will need. All right, so at this point, you may have figured out more power is always a good thing, 
even with high sensitivity speakers. We like to make this analogy. Imagine you're driving a high performance sports car with an eight or 12 cylinder gas engine. You're cruising along at 65 and you need to pull out to pass the other car in front of you. With a stomp on the gas pedal, you zoom around the other car in no time. The act of passing is akin to a dynamic passage in music. With all that extra power on board, the car and the amplifier sail right through it. Okay, so moving on, we've come to the final number that you might be curious about, which is speaker impedance. Speaker impedance is measured in ohms and it's essentially the load the speaker presents to the amplifier. You're gonna see numbers like four, six, and eight ohms. Technically, a well-made amplifier will put out more power into a four ohm speaker load, but here's where the specs get a little bit tricky. The problem is there's no universal way to measure speaker impedance. This is an issue as no speaker is just four or eight ohms as the resistance a speaker shows an amplifier changes with the frequency. Some may dip down as low as two ohms at lower frequencies and go as high as 16 or even much higher as the frequency increases. If you see the word nominal with the impedance number, that usually means it's a more honest spec of the average load the speaker presents an amp. So while one brand may rate their speakers at eight ohms, if another brand tested that exact same speaker, they might rate it with a nominal impedance of four or six ohms. Manufacturers like to show an eight ohm rating as it's more of the standard, but this doesn't mean that their speakers never dips below eight ohms. And if you're powering one pair of speakers off two channels of an amplifier, if the amplifier is of decent quality, we feel you really don't need to worry much more about the impedance number. But if you have an amp that has two pairs of speaker connections, like you see on some integrated amps, like a speaker A and B, and the speakers you wanna use have a spec of four ohms, you might overheat your amplifier when you're playing both at the same time. Now, the other case where impedance might matter here is with a tube amplifier that has different speaker connections for a different impedance. Most tube amps have four, eight and 16 ohm taps. Here, if your speaker is rated at a simple eight ohms with the word nominal, we suggest you try both and see which sounds better. If it's rated at four ohms, you should use the four ohm tap. And if it's eight ohms nominal, it will probably sound better on the four ohm tap. Six ohm speakers will definitely need to be tested on both taps. Okay, so, so far we've learned the more power, the better, but you will need less with high sensitivity speakers. And the impedance spec may not really be a big deal at all for your needs. But before we end this video, let's talk a little bit more about amplifier power as those numbers need some explaining too. First, it's important to understand an amplifier has a far easier time driving a higher frequency than a low frequency. This means if you played a test tone into an amp, it might produce 50 watts at a low frequency before it went into serious distortion, but could play up to 200 watts at a higher frequency before you hear distortion. Now, when you look at the fine print, you're gonna find some amplifiers and home theater receivers rated at say X watts per channel at 1000 Hertz, which is a much easier drive to load. While others are rated at X watts per channel from 20 Hertz to 20,000 Hertz, which is a much more honest spec. This has been a major point of confusion, especially in the soundbar realm, where you see many tiny soundbars claiming to have 500 watts or more of total power inside. But the great news here is that on June 5th of 2024, the Federal Trade Commission said enough is enough and they set a standard that all companies must follow for home entertainment amplifier ratings. They now have to warm up the amp, then test it from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz for a full five minutes to come up with their power rating. And better yet, as some companies fabricated on this, at no time can the distortion be more than 1%. We're sure this will bring down some exaggerated power ratings and allow music lovers to make an easier decision on the quality of the amplifier that they're considering. And once again, if any of this that I just went over seems a little too technical and you need some more help, our team is here for you. We'll make sure that the combination of gear that you want for your room will work well together and will fit perfectly in your room. And if you're just getting started with your setup, we have a ton of other videos and articles on how to set up a two-channel system. We have a lot of home theater buying guides, exclusive product reviews, and so much more at audioadvice.com and on our YouTube channel. I'll link them down below. And if you're also building a home theater or setting up a media room, check out our home theater central at audioadvice.com where we have our free home theater design tool. Now, if this video has been helpful to you. We hope you'll consider giving it a thumbs up, hitting the subscribe button, and turning on the notifications so you don't miss out on any of our latest content. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.